Welcome back everybody. This is Eric here with High Right Veteran 8888. Today we've got another gunsmithing video for you and we're going to be doing a full disassembly and reassembly on the Swiss K31 service rifle. This amazing rifle served Switzerland from 1931 to 1958 and they're probably one of the finest bolt action military rifles ever produced. It's very unique in that it uses a straight pull action which we'll go over here in the video and they're finely fitted beautiful fit and finish. They are fantastically made and you cannot ask for a finer military rifle in the bolt action category. So we are going to break into this and we'll talk a little bit more history and some tips and tricks and things you need to know about this uh, as we go. Before we get started, I would like to thank our friends at Otis Technologies for supporting today's video. If you are looking for any and everything that you need to take care of your firearms, from their complete cleaning kits to their you know, jags and patches and pulls and all sorts of random things that they make. They make a bunch of specialized tools for cleaning lots of guns in a specialized manner. You know, they have served the military for decades. Some of you who have been in these wars over the last 20 years have seen Otis cleaning kits, a little black cleaning kit and a little round pouch for your field expedient cleaning needs. They do a lot of other stuff as well. So check them out. Uh, Otis Technologies, really great group of people and a big thanks to them for supporting today's video. All right, we're gonna break into this. Let's do it. You know, these guns are actually not that difficult to work with. Um, they're very well built, but they don't really require a heck of a lot to keep them going, and they're pretty deceptively easy to take apart. We're gonna start by removing the magazine. You'll see this little tab right here on the side of the magazine. Squeeze it, remove the magazine. We're gonna look. All right, we can see the magazine's empty. That's great. Now, you can disassemble the magazine. There's a couple of pins here that you can push out. But unless these springs are wore out or the, the magazine is defective or if you need to replace the follower spring or something like that, uh, there's really no need to take this apart, okay? So just wipe it down, keep it clean, make sure that there's no rust or anything and you're good to go. And these are serial number to the gun. All right, we're gonna pull the bolts to the rear. Now, I know it may be hard to see, but you notice the serial number on the bolt right here. As you pull the bolt to the rear, it cams and turns the bolt to the left. All right, this is a straight pull rifle. So unlike a bolt action rifle like a, like a 98K or something like that, where you have to turn the bolt and pull it to the rear, the camming action is afforded by this, this cam in the sleeve of the bolt mechanism. We are gonna take it apart, but to work the bolt, it's just straight back and straight forward with a good smart motion. The safety on this gun is actually this cocking piece you can take this cocking piece, pull it back, and rotate it like this, and it goes into the groove and cams slightly to the right, and that locks the action shut and puts the gun on safe, okay? To put the gun back into fire, you're gonna pull this cocking ring back, and you're back in business. So we're gonna go ahead and pull the bolt all the way to the rear until it stops. Over here on the side of the rifle, you see this little uh, edged, little knob right here or whatever, you're going to push it down. It's under spring tension. Push it down and gently grab the bolt and pull it out of the rifle to the rear. Before we go any further on the rifle itself, let's go ahead and pull the bolt apart. All right. We are going to talk about some other stuff on this rifle. I'm going to set it aside for now, just out of frame here. And let's go ahead and work on this bolt. This is one of the most unique things about the K31 is the bolt design. Now these bolt designs went through a lot of different changes over the years and the K31 represents the most simplistic and strongest bolt design out of the entire series of Schmidt Rubin rifles uh, which started around the turn of the century. Okay, so the K31 does represent the, the most advanced and strongest metallurgy, the best design, the most accurate design. So we're going to go ahead and disassemble this bolt. The best way to do it is to place the bolt on a flat surface with the cocking piece facing up to the rear like this, and this also makes it easy for you to see it. Remember that safety we talked about earlier? You're gonna pick, grab, grab the bolt, hold it like this. Pick the cocking piece up, and you're gonna rotate it to the middle position. Not all the way forward like this, not all the way in the, in the fire position, but in the middle position like this. Hopefully you can see that. We're basically removing tension from the system, okay? Now, you're gonna place the bolt in your hand like this, grab the charging handle, 
Before you take anything apart, I want you to look at how all this stuff is oriented. Okay? You have your, your rotating cam that is in the collar, the locking lug and rotating cam assembly on the collar of the bolt. You have the extractor and the bolt. Notice these slots in the bolt and in the, in the actual sleeve here, how they line up. So make note of that orientation. Now that you know that orientation, go ahead and grab the charging handle and you're going to kind of just lift it out of the cam like this. It won't require any pressure. You just, you just, I'm going to put my thumb here, my fingers here, and I'm just going to give it a little, little tug like that. All right, we'll give it a tug and we push forward. Now our charging handle assembly is clear. These things don't really ever give you a lot of issues. This uh, bolt handle is made out of alloy, aluminum. The later versions, or the earlier versions rather, were made out of Bakelite, and they were prone to cracking. So in the K31, they improved this design by using alloy so that that Bakelite wouldn't crack in the field. With the bolt still in this position, go ahead and just grab the bolt and twist and pull. You'll feel it kind of locked in there. But notice the orientation like we talked about before, this slot and the bolt. As you rotate, just give it a gentle pull. Now I had a, a, apparently some grease in there that was still, you know, a little bit sticky and that's what caused it to be so difficult to remove. But if you keep your gun clean, you shouldn't have to worry about that. But if you get an unissued version or something that's still got a lot of grease, um, just twist and pull smartly. All right, now we have the rotating cam in the bolt sleeve. These are the locking lugs that lock into the front of the receiver on the K31. All we need to do is just take it and invert it like this. The bolt should fall out. So your actual bolt is separate from the locking sleeve and you can see how this assembly works. It's pretty clever actually. When the K31 extracts, it pulls the shells up and to the rear, directly up. So they don't go to the right or the left or anything. They fly up in the air really, really freaking far above the top of the rifle. So that's an interesting footnote. For the purposes of what we're trying to accomplish, this is as far as you're going to take the bolt down in this por portion. Now, <laughs> this looks like some kind of wicked syringe, doesn't it? The rear of the, uh, <laughs> the, rear of the bolt. Um, you're going to go ahead and carefully uh, grab right here, just like this, and you're going to put the, the cocking piece back in the fire position. Now, this is the position that the, that the bolt is in during the firing cycle when the uh, firing pin goes forward and hits the, the, the primer on the cartridge, okay? If we were in the safety position, make note of the position of where the firing pin is. It locks to the rear. Now normally it's pushing against the bolt and it would be pushed back considerably more, but that's the safety position. So it's gonna be the fired position all the way forward. That removes the most tension off of the spring, okay? We're going to go ahead and just cheat the spring back a little bit with our fingers, right? You're going to notice a slot here on the end of the firing pin, right? You've got a large side and a small side. The easiest way to get this thing off is to make sure that the large side is facing towards you like this. And when you compress the spring, the firing pin should just fall off like that. Don't let this thing go. It'll shoot across your workshop. Gently remove the pressure. And then of course, if we pull all the way to the rear, now the bolt is now apart and it's ready to clean. And from here, it's pretty simple. I mean, you're gonna go through and inspect, clean, look for wear, look for anything wonky. I mean, if your K31 is extracting weird or something like that, you know, you need to look at all these components. But really, all in all, they hold up really freaking fantastic and they rarely give problems. We're gonna talk about a few quirks the K31 has, but for now, there's our bolt. All right, now that we're back to the rifle itself, I'm gonna show you one of the coolest freaking features of the K31 service rifle. We're gonna go ahead and start at the rear of the rifle here, and we're gonna remove the, the butt plate. Now, for everyday cleaning, you know, you probably wouldn't need to worry about removing the butt plate, but in the case, you know, we're gonna to try to disassemble this gun as far as we can. And I think you're gonna be very, very fascinated to see what is under the butt plate of this rifle. So Swiss soldiers were required to keep their address and their name and their rank and their unit and all of that stuff in what they call a troop tag underneath the butt plate, 
and look here, we can see that we have a troop tag on this particular rifle, okay? I would notate the orientation that the screws came out, the order that the screws came out. What I like to do, since I know this screw went in this hole, I'm gonna go ahead and just put the screws back in their appropriate holes and then set my butt uh, plate off to the side with the screws still in it so that we don't get anything mixed up, even though they are the same screw, um, just in case there's something with the orientation, we wanna make sure everything goes back in the same place, every screw back in the same location. Here we have a troop tag with a variety of different information, the soldier's address, the soldier's name, the serial number of the rifle associated with it. Isn't that cool? It's just an interesting part of the history of this gun that we can trace back to who it was issued to. And that's one of the unique features of the K31. You don't really need to remove this for cleaning or for everyday servicing, but you know what? It is a cool way to identify the owner of your rifle. And one of the cool things about it is on the rear of the stock, we have the date that the stock was made. Now you can do a serial number lookup that will give you an idea of when this particular gun was made by the serial number, but you can also correlate that date with the stock. And in this case, this one was made in 1942. All right, let's move on. Now, another way that you can know when your K31 was made was also uh, by what material the stock is made out of. They did these out of walnut and out of beechwood. Walnut stocks were the earlier versions of the stocks. They switched to beechwood, I want to say around 46 or 47, kind of, you know, late World War II, getting after the end of World War II. Most of your World War II era, uh, K31 such as this one are all going to be walnut. They switched to beechwood because it wasn't as temperature sensitive and I think it was cheaper too to make. On a side note for uh, cost on these rifles, the unit replacement cost on a K31 was 42 Swiss francs. That's what it cost to replace them. And I don't know what kind of money that is today. We're going to go ahead and start with this front band. Now the hardware on the K31 is fantastic. This screw is already a little bit loose. That's probably good that we paid attention to that. You don't want that uh, giving you an issue. You're just gonna back this screw out. These are hinged, which is really cool. Now when we look at the when we look at the hardware on these guns, compared to the hardware of something like the uh, M9130, you compare <laughs> compare the hardware alone. Uh, this hardware is much better made than anything. I mean, the, the Swiss were not under the duress of warfare like Germany and, uh, and, and, and Russia were and we were at the time. So the quality control, even though this is a wartime rifle, uh, the quality on it is fantastic. So to remove the front band, you're going to loosen that screw and you can see it's hinged. This screw is actually um, sort of countersunk in place with like a little roll pin. It doesn't come out. Don't try to remove it, okay? You're going to freaking break it. Don't do that. You're going to lift the gun with the sights facing up just like this. Take both your thumbs like this, and you're going to push straight down like this. Now, people want to, sometimes want to know what this hook is on the end of the, uh, of the front cap. It's a stacking swivel. It's designed so that the guns will counter stack with each other. So like if the troops are going to go in the chow hall or whatever and they just want to leave the rifles outside, they could stack their guns. So that's a stacking swivel. The front band also encompasses the bayonet lug. Swiss K31 bayonets are very sought after and they're very expensive and you can find them. But they're also exceptional quality. You can see that the stacking swivel is retained in this as a separate piece using a hardened pin. Interesting footnote, that's a different part. But for cleaning, that's all you need to worry about there for that. We're gonna to move to the second band. All right, and again, now I wanna mention something about these screwdriver bits. Now, not every screwdriver bit is made the same. You've got hollow ground, you've got you know different types. Um, I'm using the Brownells Magnetip set for this. This is their Magnetip driver, uh, which is you know more of a traditional, almost like a mechanics driver. But they also make just kind of like standard screwdriver type ones with the holders in them. I like using the uh, the T handle because I can put a little bit, you know, I can put more pressure on it with my hand if I need to, and I, I like that they that they ratchet, which is nice. But 
an interesting foot uh, note about the actual tips themselves is that they're, the Brownells kits come with a huge variety of different screwdriver bits, both the width, okay, the, the, the thickness, and you want to choose the bit that fills the head of that screw up the best, both the width of the head of the screw and the depth of the head of the screw. And if you want to fit it by hand, what you want to do is just put this screwdriver tip in there, wiggle it back and forth. There should be very little to no movement. That's going to ensure that you're not going to booger up the head of that screw. So since we have the appropriate size bit, we're going to go ahead and remove this second band. Again, it's just a screw. We're going to back it out. Very gently. And really, these things should generally not be like that tight. Now the screw on the middle band is not retained, okay? To remove that band, we probably want to remove the sling first, okay? Tell you what, we can leave that, we, we'll leave this screw right here, we'll leave the band in place. I'm going to go ahead and turn the rifle around to remove the sling. Uh, these slings are beautiful and very well made. And I think the hardware on the K31 slings is probably the most robust out of any service rifle out there. Um, I'm probably a bit biased. Now, sometimes these cl clamps can be really, really, really stout, but you're basically going to squeeze this and push it forward, and there you go. That removes it. Okay, we're going to actually have to fully disassemble the sling to get it off the rifle. We're going to pull this off. Be careful, sometimes this leather is old and, you know, possibly a little bit brittle. We're going to go ahead and remove this keeper all the way. Pull the clamp assembly off. I'm going to bring the rifle back over here. <clears throat> and then the sling simply just threads off. It's only held in the front by just being pushed through this band assembly right here. So we're just going to go ahead and fish the sling back out, just like this. And we're going to remove it from the rifle completely. It's nice and supple. It's in very good condition, and it's beautifully marked. Beautiful markings on that with the original leather maker that made this sling. Very interesting. You'll usually see a Swiss crest on the slings as well. And this one's still in usable condition. It's uh, totally usable. We're going to take our sling and set it off to the side with our hardware. We don't need that right now, but still interesting to check out. Now, let's get back to this band. Like many military rifles, there's going to be like a leaf spring. Uh, that just puts a bit of tension to kind of hold that band in place. And that's there as a redundancy just in case the screw falls out all the way because we can see that even with the screw out, uh, the band is retained. So it's meant as a redundancy. We're going to go ahead and squeeze that. You should be able to just use hand pressure like I just did and just overcome it. And you'll notice as I push forward gently, you'll see that leaf spring lift back up in its place. Just like that. All right, we'll go ahead and take this off. It will clear the front sight, no problem, so no need for any kind of weirdness. Now what I would do is just so you don't get anything mixed up, go ahead and take that screw that you pulled out, stick it back in, and just put it back on with a little bit of finger pressure like that so you don't get anything mixed up, and place it with your other band. So now that we've got that uh, second band off of there, we can see that the handguard, nothing's holding it on, it's already fallen off. We're just going to go ahead and take the rifle and pick it up gently, and the handguard is already off. That's nice. We can see here that the handguard is serial numbered to the rifle. Got some beautiful markings in here. Looks like a proof marking, a Swiss acceptance mark. But at the end of the day, boys and girls, it's a handguard. Um, very well made. Nice piece of old school walnut from Switzerland. We're going to set that to the side. Now you can see there's a bit of blackening in here and some soot and dirt and nasty stuff. We'll go through and clean that. No problem. But those are the things you want to pay attention to. So we're going to set that aside. Now I want to make note of the fitment on these rifles, okay? I'm going to preemptively take these action screws and I'm going to just, I know we're taking the gun apart, but I want to demonstrate something. All right, that front action screw is a little loose. Look at that. So we're going to tighten that up a little more. We're going to tighten up this rear action screw a little bit. Now this particular K31, I actually haven't shot hardly at all. All right, we're going to torque those screws back down because I want to demonstrate something. Now that those action screws are nice and tight on the rear, we're going to take them back out in a minute. 
I want to show you something interesting about the way these rifles are fitted. You can see that there's a considerable amount of space here. Look at this, through and throughout. That's because these guns are floated. They're fully floated. And that really helps with, uh, with barrel harmonics, okay? I'll just take a little piece of paper here. Look, I got a piece, uh, pair of scissors. I'm just gonna cut, I, I, don't, I don't have a dollar bill on me. But I got a piece of paper, all right? We're gonna slip this piece of paper into here to show you how well these guns are bedded. Now, what this does is shows us that there's no contact between the barrel and the stock. We're gonna slide this back and forth just like this. Look at that, fully floated. Look at that, boys and girls. That is, a, that is not a military rifle, that is a target rifle. All day long, look at this. The care that they went to, to float these. Look at this, we're gonna work it. Look at that, no contact. Now there is a bit of contact up near the front on the front band, but they had to leave some contact there at the front because, a couple of reasons. One reason is because if you're mounting a bayonet on this thing, you wanna make sure that there's some good contact, you know, because there's a lot of force being put on that front uh, band if you're, you know, stacking them with stacking swivels and bayonets and things. Plus, I would imagine that they probably had this thing, you know, fitted just right so it doesn't disturb those barrel harmonics. But look how well floated these guns are. That's just an interesting footnote. When you talk about quality, boys and girls, this is a military rifle. This is not a target rifle. This is an average infantryman's rifle in Switzerland in the 40s. All right, we're gonna go ahead and remove the bottom metal. Now I torqued those action screws back down to, show, to make sure they were tight so that our barrel would float. But now we're gonna back them back out. All right, again, we're gonna look at our bit. That width looks really nice. That depth looks nice. Good solid fitment, that's something you always wanna check for. We're gonna loosen this. I would lay the rifle on its back like this. And you know, you do have a pretty flat surface with these ears, okay? Get them nice and flat, like this. Apply downward pressure, and gently break the screw. If it doesn't wanna move, don't force it too much. You may have to, you know, possibly just apply a little bit of croil or maybe some heat, but really for action screws, it should not be necessary. Be patient, take your time, be slow and deliberate, and you won't booger anything up. So you don't want your screwdriver bit to slip and scratch up your wood or scratch up your metal or anything like that. You don't wanna damage the firearm by working on it. And see, again, this is why I love these T-handles. See, I can just rotate like this by hand, okay? I'm gonna pull these screws out. Make note of the length of these screws. The front screw is the short one. The rear screw is the long one. If you don't, you know, if you don't think you're gonna remember, take a photo. We've got phones for that reason, okay? The bottom metal should lift out with absolutely no force necessary. We can see that the bottom metal is good to go. It is not serial numbered. This is a generic stamp part. It does have a Swiss accept, uh, acceptance cross on it, but other than that, this is a relatively generic, unserialized component of the rifle. We're gonna set it to the side. At this point, uh, the action should just lift right off, or actually, as the action lays as it is, we should be able to just kind of grab the nose of the barrel, lift the stock, it should just simply lift off, just like this, with no undue force. Let's take a look at the stock. I'm gonna set the action to the side for a minute. You can see the beautiful fitment. Just look at that craftsmanship. Look how well these freaking guns are fitted. I mean, look at that inlet work. It's just fantastic. I mean, you've got some hardened shims in here that allow them to bed the rifle so it's got bedding shims. Look at that. It's just the level of precision that these guns are made with, it's just awe-inspiring to me. It's fantastic. Now, if we wanted to remove the sling ferrule here on the side of the stock, obviously there's just two screws. There's really no reason to remove it unless you just want to, but I think we can all, we're all adults here, we can see that it's just two simple screws. Uh, I don't see a need to remove that. 
if we wanted to remove this hardware right here, say that this spring was wore out, you can see on the inside of the stock that there's just a little threaded ferrule. You probably have to either come up with or use some type of specialized tool uh, to unthread that. Unless it's worn out or broken or you know you need to replace it, I really would not even suggest trying to mess with it. Again, we can see that this stock is serialized to the action and there are Swiss acceptance marks on the stock. Also, an interesting footnote is the Swiss crest on the right side of the stock. Nice little cartouche. All right, we're gonna put this to the side and let's work on the action. You know, what's crazy about this gun is that we can see here, there's not really a heck of a lot going on. You know, there are very few parts. You have your rear side assembly that has a tangent rear sight. It's held in with a pin. We could drive that out if we wanted to remove it, absolutely. And then there is a leaf spring underneath. Uh, this sighting arrangement is pretty similar to just about everything that you're gonna see uh, around World War II. The front sight on the K31 is adjustable for windage. And you can see that from the factory, it is staked and notch to designate the factory zero uh, point of the rifle. The front sight post is held on with a pin but I would imagine it's also brazed and placed. I've never taken a K31 front sight post off. It might be silver soldered and pinned, if I had to guess, knowing the Swiss. We are gonna clean the bore on this rifle. Let's get the trigger out first though. So the trigger is a pretty simple overall assembly. You're just gonna grab yourself a pick, kind of like this. This is a Grace pick that I got from Brownells. And you're gonna basically take the pick and put it in the leg, a little crook of this spring right here. You can see this spring lays against this little notch. And look, when you're taking something apart, look at how it operates. Don't just go pulling things apart, let's look. So we've got a pivot here. You can see the spring puts a little tension, right? You can see how it pivots. You've got a two-stage trigger, so that's your, your first stage, and then it stops, and then you've got a second stage. The trigger on the K31 breaks at between three and four pounds. It's one of the best two-stage triggers on any military rifle on the planet ever made. And you can take that to the bank, boys and girls, that's a fact. We're gonna take this and lift this little crook up. I'm gonna grab something with a hook on it like this. I'm gonna just take the hook, captain hook, and then we're gonna relieve the tension carefully. Don't allow that spring to scratch the side of the receiver here. It will lay against it if you're not careful. Okay, now with the, with the spring tension removed, we can lift this trigger assembly out. You may have to give a little bit of force against this spring. Don't bend it too far. You're gonna break it. Okay, take the trigger out. I'm gonna grab a punch and see if we can jimmy this uh, spring out of here. Yes. So this little leg on the spring right here is sitting inside of a notch in the receiver right here. And that puts, so it's actually a really genius spring design that powers this trigger because it ensures that it can never work out of its groove and it's always put in constant tension from both sides. So it's a very great design. So we're gonna go ahead and just lift that spring right out. Notice the orientation. The crook that normally attaches to uh, the trigger itself is now to the rear. Our little fat piece we've worked out, and this little piece goes up into the right edge of the receiver. Now we should be able to just take our crook. We're gonna go through this hole. I'm just gonna simply lift gently. And now there is our spring. It goes in there in this orientation. With this leg forward, just like this. Okay, very nice. We're gonna grab our scribe, this little box right here, little hole. We're gonna grab and we're gonna pull down like this. That just comes out like that. That's your trigger assembly. That's it. That's how freaking simple these guns are. Like, they, they you know, there's no bull crap going on with this gun. You've got the hardware to keep it together. You've got the bolt. And yeah, man, what a simple, simple, simple but effective bolt action rifle. Now, this assembly is what holds the bolt mechanism in. You can see it's got a really gnarly spring here underneath. 
I would not recommend disassembling this unless you absolutely have to. Now, if you wanted to, I'm pretty sure that you can just relieve the, the tension off of the spring with a scribe or something. And I don't think... Boy, it's a gnarly spring. Yeah, I don't think it's riveted. So there is a rivet that holds this stud on, but I'm look, I'm not kidding. That spring is strong as crap. You're gonna have to compress it. And I personally would not try to remove this. I mean, it's really in there. Unless something's broken, don't worry about it. We can see the serial number on the receiver, tons of proof markings. All in all, the gun is pretty well field stripped. You probably, I mean, I would imagine that a Swiss soldier would probably never take their gun apart this far. They probably would pull the bolt out and keep the, you know, the barrel and the chamber clean and maybe clean the bolt. But I doubt that a Swiss soldier would ever have been trained to fully disassemble the gun under any circumstances. And quite frankly, nothing ever really goes wrong with them. So let's chalk this action up in the vise and talk a little bit about the chamber on this gun and we're gonna go ahead and scrub the bore a bit. And we're gonna look at the rifling. Uh, so I've got a universal cleaning kit here. This is a Shooter's Choice 30 cal cleaning kit. Uh, we're gonna check it out. We do have some CLP, a little FP10. Chad and I have been using FP10 for years, so that's a great product. A nylon cleaning brush, a jag, a mop, and then we've got a multi-piece brass kit uh, cleaning rod here with a phosphor bronze brush. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, scrub the barrel out on our K31 here and clean it up. We'll see how, uh, how it comes together. Oops, gravity's a thing, y'all. All right, let me, uh, oh, a fresh bottle of hops. Now, this stuff is gnarly. Don't get it all over your skin. Don't breathe this stuff in. Approach with caution, boys and girls. Please do. All right, we're gonna dip that in there just like this. And uh, what I would suggest you do, if you did what I just did, put the cap back on the bottle when you're done. Because, <laughs> you know, that would be very bad. You wanna clean from the chamber end forward. So we're gonna go ahead and just push the brush through with a little bit of solvent. This brass rod will ensure that we don't scratch up our uh, barrel or mess up our barrel. Now this isn't just any military rifle, this is a K31. So we wanna make sure that we're taking care of it. All right. and. I, I regret that I don't have one to show you, but the K31 cleaning kit is actually a very nice cleaning kit. Um, it's got a really nice rod, great brushes. I mean, they just, the Swiss, the Swiss really had their act together. I mean, they were just putting together some awesome stuff. All right, so we're just gonna do a couple of uh, strokes of the rod here, and we're gonna allow that uh, solvent to do some work. I'm gonna place this cleaning rod to the side. All right, I do have some of these Otis microfiber cleaning cloths we're gonna be utilizing here today. And of course, this cleaning kit does come with some patches that we're gonna utilize, a simple square two inch by two inch patch, which is uh, standard for 30 caliber. I do have uh, an older rod here with a guide on it that I've just got a, a brand new 45 Otis brush on. We're gonna go ahead and scrub the chamber. Now, this is a point of contention that I wanna mention about the K31, it's very important. Okay, these things do not have very strong extraction when you pull the bolt to the rear. So you have to keep the chamber on this gun clean. And there's also another little tiny factor that you have to keep in mind as well. And it's that some K31s have a slightly oblong chamber. It's not very common knowledge. Unless you're a hand loader, a lot of people don't know this. Okay, but they do have it's sometimes an oblong chamber. So in combination with the chamber getting dirty and the slight oblong nature of the chamber, especially if you're talking about hand loads, the cleanliness of the chamber is extremely important. The chamber must be kept clean. Take a chamber brush, scrub that chamber. You'll feel it kind of push into the lead of the rifling. You don't want to get in too far, but take a good fitting brush, a chamber brush, and really scrub that chamber. What I like to do is, you know, while I've got, I've, I've got the hops working in the chamber, we've coated the bore down and swapped the bore out a time or two. What I'd like to do at this point is go ahead and take the same brush that I used for the chamber, and I'm gonna go ahead and just kind of gently scrub the, the side rails, what we call the raceways. These are bolt raceways right here. 
and we want to make sure they're free of dirt or components or anything that's going to cause any kind of undue function. You don't have to get hard in there, you know, just be gentle. All right. I've got some of these abnormally large Q-tips. Look, <laughs> look how freaking big that Q-tip is. What? I mean, like, you know, it's a huge Q-tip. So we're going to take this Q-tip and get in there and clean the raceways out with this Q-tip while our solvent's kind of working here. And that'll allow me to get in all the little cracks and crevices and get all the little dirt and scum and crap out of here. Okay. I mean, these guns are pretty forgiving. You can see here on the top of the receiver, you also have a, clip, a stripper clip notch. Uh, the magazine can be removed from the action, of course. You know, it attaches, and but it's made to be fed with stripper clips. It takes a six-shot cardboard waxed stripper clip. Pretty interesting. If you've watched any of our range videos on the K31, you've seen us use the stripper clips. They're pretty unique. And a side note, is that the strip eclipse will work with the Craig Jorgensen as well. All right, we're gonna get up here and clean the feed ramp, which really this gun is exceptionally clean. I mean, it is just wonderful. Really nice example. Not a whole lot of dirt in the raceways, not a lot to report there, but you get the idea. I'm just trying to kind of give you the general premise. All right, we're going to take our cloth, wipe our rod off, because you wanna get all the solvent off the rod. You know, if you're gonna go and get this thing cleaned up afterwards, you don't wanna put more solvent back in there. We're gonna carefully remove the brush. All right, we're gonna depart a little bit from this cleaning kit. I'm not a huge fan of Jags. They have their place, but I like patch pullers. We're gonna take this square patch and go ahead and thread it through our patch puller, just like this. You wanna fold it in half long ways, like you're making a quesadilla, like this, mmm, quesadillas. And then you're gonna Go through here, just like this, and pull it about halfway, about like that. So let's go ahead and put a patch through the barrel and just see what kind of nasty we're working with. Now, if you have a really worn bore brush, you can wrap a patch around it loosely and get a really tight fit if you want. Um, depending on the gun, you know, like if you've got a really nice target rifle or something, you probably don't want to treat your bore like that. But if it's a real crusty military rifle, you can get away with it. I won't tell anybody. All right, so here's a single patch through the K31. This is after years of storage. Look at that. Just a little bit of powder residue. Um, now the hoppies will turn the copper, the copper will oxidize and turn like a green bluish color. And that's how you know you've got copper in the barrel. In this case, we've got some fouling, but for the most part, I mean, oh wow, that barrel looks brand new. So I don't really see a whole lot of difficulty there. We're gonna go ahead and pull another patch through. This time placing a little bit of emphasis on making sure we dry that chamber out really well. And the raceways, because we did put some solvent in the raceways. So I'm gonna clean those. And then we're just gonna kind of work that patch back and forth in the chamber, just to make sure we really get all the solvent out of that chamber. All right, then we're gonna go ahead and push her home all the way through. And you can work that patch back and forth. It's not gonna hurt it to change direction. I mean, especially as clean as this gun is. If it, if it was a really, really nasty mill cert with a rough bore, you don't wanna change the direction of the patch. But something with as nice of a fit and finish as this K31, look how smooth. I mean, that patch, I mean, look at that. Hardly no dirt on this patch. It cleaned up beautifully. So now we're gonna go ahead and lubricate the bore. Now, before you shoot again, you wanna make sure that you dry your bore out you don't want to shoot with oil in your bore. Take the same patch puller, place yourself a patch on there just like this, and we're going to go ahead and uh, let's try some of this FP10. Chad and I have used this stuff quite a bit over the years. We've been quite pleased with it. Um, this is a shooter's choice product. All right, let's give it a try. We'll go ahead and start by kind of lubricating the raceways on the receiver a little bit. I'll put a little bit of oil there in the receiver. Ain't going to hurt a dang thing. Okay, and then the chamber. We'll go ahead and put a little oil on her. I'm satisfied. It looks good. What a great looking bore on this gun. Wow. The bore looks absolutely brand new. So that's one thing about the K31 as well. They are usually in fantastic condition. 
there's not really a lot to report here, boys and girls. This is one clean example. I think you guys get the idea. The big takeaway from this on the K31, clean that chamber. Keep the chamber clean. That's the biggest thing. As long as you do that, everything's going to be good. So the action I'm happy with. We're going to go ahead and quickly just go over and glass over some of the small components and do a little bit of precise cleaning. And then we're going to get this bad boy back together. All right, boys and girls, we're going to quickly go through and just clean some of these components. Mainly the ones that I noticed were dirty. Uh, our bolt mechanism. Let's go ahead and get that whole bolt me mechanism back over here. And this is going to be what we're going to put back together first. But before we do, you know, when you have it apart, think about it. It's just like you do something on your car. You always want to check stuff. I mean, look, we got some dirt and nasty stuff in here. I'm just going to kind of scrub that a little bit. I mean, this thing is in stellar condition. I don't think we could ask for better. I mean, we don't have to get crazy on the cleaning because this thing is just wonderful. Yeah, that, that was just some loose carbon. Not a big deal. We'll get in here and clean that out because we, we it did give us a little bit of, of resistance when we pulled it apart earlier. So I just want to make sure there's no grease or anything weird stuck in there. If you got an air compressor, you know, grab your air compressor and kind of blow it out a bit. All right, for the bolt mechanism itself, looks pretty good. Now, uh, one thing I didn't mention earlier about the extractor, you know, I mentioned not to remove it uh, unless you really needed to, but I didn't tell you how to remove it. So what you want to do is just grab yourself like a little Allen key, kind of like this, a long skinny one. And all you're going to do is lift up on it like this. And you will see there's like a little bend in it, a little crook. All you got to do is lift it up until you see that little crook. And you're going to gently place it in there like that. Okay, give it a little bit of tension forward, you know, chalk this thing up in your vise, give it a little smack, and it'll pop right out. Use great care. You do not want to break this extractor. I would suggest not removing it unless you absolutely have to, but this is how you remove it. You can see that there's a step there that holds it in place. You have to lift it up and slave it there to get it out. We're not going to remove it, but I just want to cover that real quick so you know. Now you know. So this bolt looks fantastic. I mean, just beautiful. So I'm not really seeing anything overly weird. Uh, we do have a little bit of oil on this bolt, probably just from storage. Um, when these guns, you know, were shipped with their original cleaning kits and stuff, they had, so they had a special um, low temperature grease that they used to use for these guns called um, Waffenment, I think is what they called it. I think that's the name for it. And it was a, a specially formulated grease for their climate. So whenever you see a K31 floating around, you can usually kind of tell um, if it's got some of that grease still on it because it's, um, it's not a super heavy grease. It's kind of like, a, you know, here in the U.S., um, especially like in the 50s, we used to have this grease that we issued called uh, LSA. And it was, uh, was kind of like an intermediate weather grease. And that's really all this is. It's kind of like their version of our LSA uh, grease. Yeah, man, this thing is clean as a whistle. And there's just not a lot going on here. Let's get this bolt back together. Okay. We're going to start by going ahead and putting the bolt mechanism back in the cocking sleeve, just like this. Line those up and just kind of set it to the side for now. I like to consolidate parts, you know, that way um, it's just less to, you know, worry about. All right. We know that the bolt, the orientation that it's in the rifle, it looks like this. Okay. You can see the charging handle would be on the right, like if this is the barrel, like this, right? And we know that the fire position is the firing pin being all the way forward like this. So we're going to go ahead and put it back the way we found it, just like that. Take your spring, place it over the firing pin again, just like in the, in the same direction. We're going to go ahead and compress the spring with the cocking piece down on a hard surface. Compress the spring. It requires a bit of force, okay? Again, remember the stepped part. You got the large part, the small part. Take the large part. Come in, it can be either direction, it doesn't matter, and allow the spring to hold the firing pin back in place. All right, and then we're going to take the bolt, uh, the firing pin, I'm sorry, to the rear, and we're going to compress it and put it in the middle just like this. All right, just like we did before. Be careful, that thing will pop around and, and uh, pinch your fingers if you're not careful, but that's the position it needs to be in for us to reassemble it. Now remember the orientation I told you on the bolt? 
of these slots kind of lining up. Take the slots. See if I, if I turn it, see how the, slots, how the slot is? Take the slots and line it up. Place your, your index finger like this to hold it in place. Place the assembly together. And then just while holding pressure here, you're going to just rotate gently until it comes into place. Now, while holding that same pressure and maintaining the gap, because you can see that when this gap is in place, what other gap is also in place? The gap on the side of the cam that the charging handle has to sit in for us to put it back together. So we're going to maintain that relationship of the gap with our index finger, and we're going to rotate the rear of the breech block in the half cock assembly like this until this slot lines up with the slot in the bolt itself and the annular groove of the cocking assembly. Now from this point, all we're going to do is take the charging handle, which, you know, we do have a bit of grease on this thing. We'll, we'll wipe a little bit of that grease off. It's not too heavy, but we'll spread that grease out a little bit. And I tell you what, we do have some of this uh, MC-10. We'll spray a little bit of this MC-10 on here. This is a, uh, a very similar grease, a spray grease. So we'll lubricate that back up. All right, again, we'll pick the assembly back up, ensuring that those slots align and that the rear slot on the bolt is in line with the slot in the, in the inside of the bolt. Take the charging handle assembly, start from the rear, rotate it in like this, and it's, it'll slide back, you know, pretty good ways like this. You're gonna slide it back until this notch sits down in that groove like this, just like that. Now, here's the tricky part because the bolt can fall apart in your hand if you're not careful. While maintaining pressure with your index finger on the front, um, grasp the entire assembly like this and hold everything together. And now from here, you're simply going to remember, we had this on the half cock position with it cheated back to the rear in this position. Now, while holding everything nice and steady, you're gonna rotate back to the fire position. The bolt is now ready to go back into the rifle. Let's assemble the rest of the rifle. And well, first we'll check a few of these parts, but overall, you know what? I'm not seeing anything overly uh, nasty. I mean, from this point, you're gonna clean the gun like you normally would. Let's go ahead and get the rest of it back together. So the recess that the trigger sits in, there's not really a lot that can go wrong, but we are just gonna get in here and just kind of break up any dirt or debris or gunk that could be in there. Um, the little part of the brush, the, the smaller area is real good for getting in this little spot here. We're just gonna kind of break up anything that might be in place. We got a little bit of grime in there, nothing too bad, okay? You can actually take your gunsmithing pliers. These are non-marring, they're real smooth, and you can always just take a patch and grab it with your gunsmithing pliers like this. You know, grab it kind of tight and just get in there and maybe twist it like this and get in there and use that as a tool to kind of get in there and clean this out. And you don't have to worry about these uh, gunsmithing pliers marring anything, okay? They're smooth, so nothing gets scratched up. All right, these are made by FD. I got these through Brownells. I'll, I'll try to maybe tell you guys where I got, where, which, uh, which brand these are, but that's a great little set of pliers for that sort of thing. All right, and then of course, you could always just grab some compressed air. Blow out any little, little gunk or crap in there, okay? We're gonna go ahead and put this trigger back in. Now remember, our spring has to go in first. All right, this block's got a little bit of crud on it, but nothing too bad. All right, it goes in in this orientation. So you've got a little leg here and you've got a window. Remember, our window is facing down. That's what we pulled out. We're gonna go ahead and put that back in. And we'll take the same scribe we pulled it out with and we're just gonna advance it up as far as it'll go until it stops, just like that. Now remember our spring, this rear leg, so that little notch on the other side of that, that piece of stamped metal is where that is going to sit. So what I would do is I would grab it like this, pinch it like this, and I would start that leg in there like this. I would bring that rear leg back over the, the other part like this. And then you might even be able to do it just with your fingers like I'm doing here. Look at that. I was able to compress it without using a tool. But for, for showing you better, I'm going to go ahead and just grab this little loop here. And I'm going to pick up with it. I'm going to use a little bit thicker of a 
of a pick here. This one's got a little bit more, more meat on it. You know, because this is a pretty stout spring. We're going to lift it up just like this, compress it, push down. And there's a notch right here. It's a little tiny notch, about a sixteenth of an inch wide, that that little leg sits in. So now our spring is back in place. It's exactly where it needs to be. We're also going to check to make sure that we've got good spring pressure on this guy. Look at that. Okay, that's looking good. Now our trigger will simply go back in. And it's a beautifully, deceptively simple arrangement. We're just going to put it back in the way we took it out. You may have to lift this leg out of the way like this for it to clear. It's quite all right. Boys and girls, that's it. It's just that simple. We're going to grab our scribe, and you know, we do have a little crook here. We can grab it and carefully. I would actually even use something with a bit of hook, just like this. All right. You could lift it too, I guess. Look, we'll just lift it. I'm going to lift it, put it under there, and we'll check the function of the trigger. First stage, second stage. Everything looks wonderful. While we got this apart, we'll spray a little bit of this MC-10 on here and let it creep. Not going to hurt a dang thing. Okay. That looks good. I'm, uh, I'm comfortable with that. That's looking nice. And now it's pretty much, uh, let's just put this rifle back together. Um, now, one other thing I would probably mention we want to do, uh, I am going to make sure we oil uh, the bottom of the rifle. You know, we've, we've been handling this thing on and off, and, you know, I'd put some type of good preservative um, whatever you want to run. Uh, you can run what you want, but definitely make sure you wipe down with oil uh, the bottom part of this barrel that's going to be, you know, underneath the wood line because moisture can get to it and, you know, plus you've been handling it and you've got your, you know, nasty crap all over. I mean, look at that. So we're just going to lubricate this action, kind of wipe it down and oil it to preserve it. I mean, don't get crazy. You don't want to get oil soak in your stock. Okay, but you get the idea. We're just going to, you know, wipe down the action with some oil to preserve it. A little bit of copper oxidation. Look at that, the green. All right, so on the stock, we're just going to take the action, drop it back in. What I would do is I would, I would drop it into where the tang butts up with the recess in the stock. All right, butt that up and just drops right in. I mean... It's really, there's no voodoo. <laughs> I mean, that's all it is, okay? And again, remember like before, we're going to invert the gun. And then we're going to just work in the opposite direction. Now, I'm going to take a fresh brush that doesn't, you know, hasn't had a whole bunch of crap done to it. And I'm just going to check here, the stock. There's a little bit of dirt right there. Let's just kind of, you know, don't get crazy, but... If there's a, you know, anything that could affect the bedding or where the, you know, any of that happens, you just want to try to just give that a little scrape and make sure there's nothing in the way. All right, our bottom metal looks gorgeous. Not a problem there. That simply just drops back in place, and you can clearly see where that goes. Okay, that sort of goes back in place. All right, remember our action screws. If you didn't know, take a photo. <laughs> the front one is the short one, remember? And the rear one is the long one. We're going to put that back in. If you can start them by hand, great. If not, don't sweat it. That's what tools are for. We're going to take our same driver and we're going to gently begin to tighten these screws back up. See how I'm using just hand pressure? I'm not even using the tool. I'm just twisting it with hand force. That's good. Okay. Same thing on the rear. If it moves, great. If not, we use the tool. Always start something by hand if you can. If you know you want to use the least amount of force possible to reassemble, these are old rifles, y'all. You got to give them a little, little bit of time. All right, now we've got that rear screw going in. All right, so just like your uh, your wheel lugs on your car, same thing with these. You know, you don't want to over tighten one or the other. Just go ahead and tighten until. You know, you feel a bit of resistance, move back and tighten this one, go back, tighten this one, you see? <clears throat> that looks good. Not too much force, not firmer tight, but you definitely want these action screws tight. 
Mm, okay. That looks good. So there's our bottom metal. We can leave the magazine out. We don't need that right now. Let's go ahead and put our butt plate back on. I just wanted to show you the troop tag. That was really the only reason we pulled it off. But remember, we uh, put our screws in the exact same location that they were in so that we can put them back where they belong. The troop tag was on the bottom screw. I'm just gonna put that back on like this. And then we're gonna carefully put this assembly back in place. Just like this. Pretty simple. Now one little trick, um, let's just say if you're at a gun show or you're at a, a gun shop and let's just say they have numerous K31 service rifles and you wanna see if it's got a troop tag, okay? Um, you can actually just usually loosen one screw and this butt plate will, will come off and rotate enough for you to be able to see a troop tag. Just like that. See how that troop tag slid out? So you just wanna kinda pop it back in like that, hold the butt plate down to hold the troop tag in and then go ahead and tighten your screws back down. And you know, it doesn't really matter how tight these are, just, just run them down until they stop and then give them a nice, nice little turn just to make sure they're snug. I mean, look, these guns are getting older, don't blow the wood out. You don't have to do it monkey tight. So there's our butt plate. Now from here, it's just as simple as going ahead and replacing all of our hardware on the stock. Not a whole lot to do here. We're gonna take our front handguard, which looks really nice, beautiful piece of walnut. There is a step, it's very tiny. There's a little lip. You wanna make sure that that lip goes up under the sight block. It's impossible not to see it. The easiest way to ensure that you do it is to place the rifle down in this position, slide to the rear until it butts up and stops and then place it down, let it lay down. As you're working, make sure you're keeping your bench clean and move all of your crap out of the way so you're not scratching up your gun. All right, from here, we're gonna go ahead and replace the sling ferrule, the rear one, which we may, look at that. Gorgeous. That went on just fine. And remember, we did capture that screw in there so we don't have to worry about finding it laying all over the bench or you know, finding its way all over the floor or something. And then, you know, I have a feeling that we can't just call up a Swiss Arsenal and order a new screw. So, and it is a very specialized little screw, so don't lose it. Now remember, on the front band, the front screw is captured. Don't remove it, okay? Again, the same way it came off, we're just gonna place it back on from the bottom. And it is going to sort of line up, look at that, lined up beautifully without any force required. And then what we'll have to do is just, I would hold the gun like this, with your right hand or whichever hand you are, and then take your screwdriver. You may have to hold this assembly together and sort of pinch it to get it to start. And then we're just gonna gently start that screw. Don't get too tight on this front hand guard here, okay? You don't wanna get silly. I'm gonna get a slightly tinier bit. I do not wanna scratch this freaking thing up. Get just, oh, perfect size, okay. Don't get this thing farmer tight. Just enough to get it nice and snug. All right, <clears throat> that looks good. Now, we're gonna take the bolt assembly and replace it. It's very simple. From the rear, push in, and that's it. It'll overcome the spring pressure of the, of the bolt stop, and you're good to go. I want smooth as butter. We'll do a functions test. Chamber's clear. Bolt unlocks, first stage, nice take up. Second stage, nice beautiful pull. Safety, bolt locks shut. No sear engagement, triggers out of engagement. There you go, there's your K31. We're gonna take the magazine, replace it. Now one last thing, every good soldier needs a sling, right? We can put the sling back on. I think you guys get the idea, but we'll go ahead and toss this sling back on on camera just so you guys can get an idea here. Um, we're gonna start, let's see here, we gotta go, that goes like this. So we're gonna lay it like this, fish it through. Looks like we're gonna go back through again. Just like this, okay. You can see this is for adjustment. 
So you have the sling address with the little keeper. Okay. You come here on the rear. <clears throat> we have the clamp assembly. Now you can see where this sling sat for a long time and you can see where it, where it kind of found its memory. All right, and we see the way this sling lays. We want this clamp to be in, uh, yeah, <laughs> I had to think about that for a second. You want it in this position, just like this, because obviously this, this uh, clamp is just gonna fish back through here. Actually, I believe it's fished the other way. It sure was. You know what? That's an oversight on my part because otherwise you're not gonna be able to get it back off. So we're gonna reverse that, actually. You want this facing in the upward position because otherwise, how in the heck are you gonna be able to get it out, right? So you can start from the rear, just clamp it through. All right, now we see the length of where this thing was set before and where our little sling stud, we'll put that back in there, the little keeper, which this thing's pretty well worn, but life's gonna go on. There you are, there's your sling back on the rifle. Okay, you can adjust it right here. When I put them on the racks, that's how I like to have them kind of nice and tight so they don't get wrapped up on anything else. Well, there's your K31 service rifle, boys and girls. Thank you so much for watching. I'm going to let y'all go. Uh, I think this is pretty close to the point as I can get. Um, they're great rifles. If you find one, definitely check them out. They are fantastic. Thank y'all so much for watching. Have yourselves a wonderful day. We'll see you next time.